here. Uh, so as Anna already told, uh, this section is supposed to be about health innovation. So we are going to show different things about how health uh, is being uh, changing along the time. So without further more uh, starting, I'm going to introduce you to Professor uh, Lawrence Aronheim. Uh, he is a professor from Johns Hopkins University and he's going to talk to us about health innovation. So uh, it's a pleasure to bring here Professor Lawrence. Thank you very much. So we should probably clarify up front. It's not exactly about health innovation. It's more about innovation in general. Okay. And anyway, I think it's obviously applicable to the health state. I think it's applicable to all spaces. So first of all, thank you for inviting me today. Um, my plan for the next 30 minutes or so is to talk about the process that we use to teach innovation at Johns Hopkins. Okay? And our objective is to try to reduce 
the uh, seeming randomness of most innovation activities and to bring them under what we call analytical control. We have used this structured approach, I would like to think, with some modest success at both the Technion and at, and at Hebrew University, both in Israel. And it was that approach that led me to uh, inspire the invitation today. I hope you find it interesting. And if you don't, it's only 30 minutes. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, um, first, again, I want to emphasize that this is a classroom methodology. Okay, I'm not a consultant. I don't work in industry. It's a classroom methodology. Um, we also believe that it has wider applicability to industry, which is something that we are starting to explore, and which I actually hope is the subject of today's discussion afterwards. Okay, because you guys, from what I can see, apart from us, are all from it, from it from industry, right? But anyway, I think that, that would be a part of the, the, the discussion, how these things could apply. All right, as a quick overview, um, the, the methodology that we have developed involves two intersecting models. The first is a structured approach, structured process, including a wide range of tools, techniques, templates, to identify problems that are worth solving across increasing horizons of uncertainty and time scale. And, and time scale. The goal of this process is the creation of a bank of ideas. Literally, in terms of a classroom, hundreds and hundreds of ideas over the course of a semester um, uh, that can then be evaluated for opportunities. From this bank of ideas, students form teams around the best ones, those which they believe take advantage of high technological and market uncertainty while minimizing financial and implementation risks. So this comes out of the second model, namely that risk and uncertainty are not the same thing. They are entirely different domains which can and should be treated differently and which, when done so, we believe can confer great advantage to those who recognize the difference. So let's get started. Um, first, one word about these, these slides. These are not corporate slides. You know, a picture and three little words, okay? These are classroom slides. They're available, I think this is being filmed, right? Okay, so they're available to you anyway. And if anybody ever need, needs anything, do not hesitate to reach out over LinkedIn or to send me an, an email. Okay. So uh, to begin, my name is Lawrence Ehrenheim and I'm a full-time faculty member, as was mentioned at the Whiting School of Engineering at John, Johns Hopkins. Again, I'm not here to speak about the, what goes on in the famous research labs at, at Hopkins, but the work that my colleague Sasha Cochran and I do as teachers in our innovation and business design classes. By way of background, um, Johns Hopkins was founded in 1876, which was then, which what was then the largest philanthropic donation ever in America given by Mr. Johns Hopkins to create the nation's first research, research school, um, based on the German models, of course. Sasha and I work for the Whiting School. That is our building right there, okay? It's now called Wyman Hall, but it's actually the old Marine Hospital in Baltimore. As you can tell, I like old photographs. Okay. Um, and so I've got them all over my slide. Um, anyway, these days, um, innovation and its importance need no introduction, either at Hopkins nor at any of the other uh, wonderful schools, you know, the other great schools that are presenting here today. In our opinion, to do innovation requires three things, a problem worth solving, a solution that solves the problem, and a business case that makes sense and that allows the solution to scale. Reality is you can start anywhere, okay? And there's all kinds of examples. You start with the problem, the solution, the business case, 
But at the end of the day, all three of them need to be there. From a curricular perspective, from the perspective of a classroom, it makes the most sense to start with problems. It's the clearest, the cleanest, and it makes the most sense to uh, students. And again, and classroom is still the primary purpose of my, of my talk here. So of course, out in the world today, there are lots of problems that are worth solving and worth working on. Cancer, nuclear proliferation, collapsing infrastructure, pandemics. I'm in Sao Paulo. Traffic, anybody? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, uh, but what we're speaking about is having students find their own problems, problems that speak to them, that call their, their names, and they can actually do something else, uh, something about. Very simply, our task of teachers is to help students find the best problems to study and solve, because at the end of the day, the best problems are the best opportunities. In short, problem first. Over 15 years ago, I was part of the team that created the Center for Bioengineering Innovation and Design, CBID, it's called CBID, at Johns Hopkins. It was a part of the, uh, the part of the, it's a, it was part of the hospital and the BNE departments. Um, and it was kind of, it was rather unique um, um, in its day. And the idea was to create a graduate level version of the famous undergraduate design teams at Hopkins. Okay, all of us who are teachers now, every engineering department has design classes and design teams now, and design thinking is a part of everything that we do. At the undergraduate level, the design teams receive the projects from physicians and surgeons at the, at the, at the hospital. The idea was for the graduate students to go out and find their own problems to work on. And after that, they still have to solve them, develop the business case, okay? The idea was to find them themselves. So how do you do that? The students arrived around June 1st, and they literally spent the entire summer hanging out at the hospital, okay? Working with physicians and surgeons. Again, okay, nothing that's now unusual, but this was a long time ago, okay? Working with physicians and surgeons to identify problems. By the end of the summer, they had built a bank of literally hundreds and hundreds of ideas. And then the trick is what? Pick the best ones. Pick the best ones, okay, and then form the teams, the teams, the teams around them. So this, and here's an example, okay, of teams that, you know, the graduate level team, they create little startups around it, and they try to commercialize their, their inventions. But the idea still is always get out of the building, work with Positions work with people who are facing real problems. Okay. All this went very well. And it went well enough that the computer science departments and the graduate school of engineering wanted the same kind of program, which we developed. And it all went along swimmingly until about six years ago, we had the opportunity to work with NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and their innovation hubs out of Virginia and Brussels. Several NATO officers came to our graduate engineering class and asked the students to design the small combat team of the future. Did students like the sound of that project? They loved it. Are you kidding me? They loved it, okay? You know, they all played video games. I don't know what they did, okay? They thought this was just the coolest project ever. Okay, so what was the process? Same as it always is. Go out, talk to people, spend time with people, got, build their bank of ideas, come back, pick the best ones, what they thought, present to the NATO officers, and what they come up with? Nothing. Absolutely nothing interesting. The question is why? That's what got us thinking about all of this in a much more in a, in a much deeper way. Why did they come up with nothing interesting? 
because they were attempting to address problems of small combat teams and logistics. Small combat teams and, small combat teams and, and they didn't actually design the small combat team of the future. And there's no way to design the small combat team of the future without also thinking about the future of war. For anybody who has, if you're paying any attention to the news these days, okay, and what goes on in faraway places, okay? So the problem was that the question that we had asked was wrong. And of course, we had set the students up for failure. All they had done was follow the traditional process, get out of the building, talk to people. The problem is that that tends to be very strongly so present focused. So in our opinion, while it is important, and we don't want to minimize it, to get out of the building, it is just as important to get out of your own head. Otherwise, you are stuck or likely stuck in the present. It is not only a matter of seeing what real people are really working on, but of being able to imagine alternative futures. Think about all the stuff that has been invented to solve a problem and then ends up being used elsewhere. My personal favorite example is Marconi. Marconi invents what? Wireless telegraphy to solve what problem? To send messages where there are no wires, ship to shore, ship to, to ship. What does it not enter his head to invent? Radio, which comes 20 years afterwards. And what is a, a, a radio? It's simply a means to send messages to nobody in particular and then send and then try to sell them stuff. Think of tablets, smartphones. The, uh, it is endless. The things that have been invented to solve problems and then get, get, get used in very different, different kinds of ways. The critical element here is time and the flow of time. Problems are found at different boundaries of uncertainty, short, medium, long-term. The question is for us, what problems will you find when you get to the medium and long terms? And we would argue they, they are not so easily found by getting out of the building. I just saw an article about this a little while ago. Okay, this is called Delta's Parallel Reality. I have not the foggiest idea how it works, okay? But basically, you and I are at the airport, we click on something on our phones, we stand next to each other, and we see completely different boards. I don't know, okay? But that, that's, that's what, what the article said, okay? Now, Delta invents this to solve, at least according to the article, two very specific problems. One, people missing their flights. You look up at all those lines on the board and it's easy to get confused if you're flying from Baltimore to Chicago and there's 50 flights a day. It's easy to get through. people miss their, their flights. The other thing people do is they run through airports looking at their cell phones and they get hurt or they hurt somebody else. The Delta said, okay, you can put this up there, okay? Every, you look up, you see the board, it's to you, okay? Cool, really. Maze, at least for non-engineers it is, okay. And, but the question is, is that the ultimate problem that's going to be found with technologies like this? Make sure people get to their flights on time. I'm gonna go back to Marconi and wireless, okay. Somebody is gonna look at technology like this and find all kinds of amazing things to do with it. The question is, how do you find those, those, those next amazing things? Brainstorming, sitting around the coffee table, brainstorming, okay. But it's random and getting out of the building, I would argue again, is too present focused. So the first of our models 
Um, the part of the problem here is that the word problem is problematic because it can refer to a whole range of problems, and we call all of them problems. It's the English language, what can I say? So what we try to do is straighten this out, at least for the purposes of this. We create a model that, let's add, tries to identify three different kinds of, of, of problems, right? Across different time horizons, what is probable, what is plausible, and what is possible. And we have called them well-defined, ill-defined, and undefined. Each kind of problem asks a different kind of question, requires different kinds of tools, different kinds of solutions, and different kinds of business cases. Let me give you an example. Prosthetics. These are all out of the world of prosthetics. Well-defined. How can we make a brain-controlled prosthetic hand with a sense of touch for less than $1,000? It's a well-defined problem. Why? But I, again, I don't know. I don't, it, the, the solution could be unbelievably difficult. Okay? That's not the point. It's a well-defined problem because the criteria for success are clear. The solution that you build, it works or it doesn't work. It's falsifiable. The criteria for success are clear. But what about these? Ill-defined. What's the next big thing in a technological or market space? What's the next big thing in 3D printing and prosthetics, or robotics and prosthetics, or personalized prosthetics, or how prosthetics are acquired? Is there a single answer there? Are the criteria for success a part of the question? No, it's simply what's the next big thing? And there are lots of things that could be the next big thing. And so the answer is a list of opportunities. What about this one? What is the future of prosthetics? That's not even a problem in the normal sense of the term because what it's asking about is future states future states that can then be explored for, for problems um, that could be of interest to begin, begin now. These three, three problems exist, or these three problem types, I should say, exist on a continuum, hence the dotted lines. What we do in class is we use undefined and ill-defined problems to explore for opportunities and build that bank. Okay, and the bank, again, for us, it's a, a semester, but we build that bank over a, a term until it is occupied with hundreds and hundreds of ideas. We pull out of that what we believe are the best oppor opportunities and turn the best ones into well-defined problems that can actually be solved. And assuming we have time, I'm going to give you a little, a little case study um, um, to show that in, in a bit. And if we have even more time, I'll give you, I got a few slides to show, to show you at least a few of the tools that we actually, actually, actually use. And if we don't have the time, feel free to send me an email and I'm happy to um, um, get, back, get back to you. Okay. So from a curricular perspective, this is the order we like to go because it seems to make a lot of sense to, 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 to students. And along with these, we create, as I said, a wide range of tools, techniques, and templates to do the actual scoring. Okay. Now, you've got your bank. Doesn't work again. Doesn't work. All right. You've got your bank now. Hundreds and hundreds of ideas. Which are the best oppor opportunities? You ask a group of students, generally speaking, they're going to go right to impact, okay? Which are the ones that are going to change the world? The biggest impact, and yet feasibility, personal preference, you had some other stuff in there. And that's how they usually choose the best oppor opportunities. Um, but what we would like to, to suggest to everyone here is a second model um, that I think can, can help us here. And we propose that the best opportunities 
are where the solution likely takes advantage of technological and market uncertainty while minimizing risk. Risk and uncertainty, even though we combine them often in, in everyday English, are not the same. The difference, risk has, probable, has probabilities associated with it. Insurance is risk-based, okay? Based on the start, on history, statistics, but there are probabilities associated. Uncertainty, as Frank Knight laid out in the 1920s, had, does not have such probabilities. Entrepreneurs are rewarded for what? Uncertainty or risk? Uncertainty. They're rewarded for uncertainty. Nobody except a gambler willingly takes on risk. Okay? You try to minimize risk to the extent possible. They are rewarded for taking on uncertainty. Okay, and again, these are just developed years and years ago. So in our mind, uncertainty is technological and market risk financial and, 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 and implementation adoption. These can be laid out on a two by two box. Of course, we all love two by two boxes. Okay. Uncertainty and risk. Upper right, high uncertainty, high risk. Who plays there? High uncertainty, high risk. The traditional answer is governments. Think hypersonics, nuclear energy at its beginning. But for, for, for that matter, airplanes at the, the, the beginning, okay? Quantum computing at the beginning. As uncertainty is reduced, and you get to the bottom right, okay, who plays there? Lower uncertainty, but still high risk. Giant corporations, big companies play there. Let me give, a, a, give you a small example. I was reading the, the other day that a bunch of companies want to start battery factories in the United States. How much does it cost to build a battery factory? Like eight billion dollars or something. Okay, huge amounts of money. High uncertainty or high risk? It's high risk because of the scale of the investment and what could happen in the marketplace. But it's not so, so high uncertainty. Like these are companies that know how to build factories and they know how to build batteries. But the risk is still out there. Bottom left, low uncertainty, low risk. Who plays there? I would argue that most corporate R&D departments play there. Small, incremental improvements. Again, these are important things. We're not saying that they're, that they're not. But that's where corporate R&D departments tend to play. Why? Because it's all known. Low risk, low uncertainty. Where we think innovation, particularly in these models, and the best opportunities come from is that upper left block. Higher uncertainty, while at the same time minimizing, minimizing risk. This, by the way, isn't anything new. This was pointed out by Amar Day over 20 years ago in, in his work on the, on the origin of new ventures and what he called promising startups. And he claimed that innovation was always a matter of technological or market insights, seeing what others do not see. If it were obvious, then what? Everybody would be there, including giant companies. If it's not obvious, that's where the opportunities for innovators are. Google and Microsoft are now obvious to us all, but they weren't once. Every big thing now was once not obvious. Okay, and why? Because they were playing in that, in that, in that upper left quadrant. So here's the question. Where future technologies and markets are uncertain, how do you know which are the best problems to work on? And I would argue to some extent, you don't, which takes us back to the idea of creating a bank of opportunity, opportunities, placing lots of small, small bets, trying them and seeing which ones work out. And we, in a classroom, do this in a structured manner, week by week by week. And part of the question that I hope will be some of the discussion to, to, uh, to today is how applicable such things are um, to uh, industry outside of a classroom environment. I want to emphasize something. 
This is not design thinking. Design thinking is about what? Going out, you know, design, getting a problem, designing the solution, talking to people, iterating the solution back and forth. Okay, it's not. What we're talking about is problems that are at the start of the design thinking process. To summarize, <laughs> Johns Hopkins, we use a structured approach to create a portfolio of opportunities by exploring undefined and ill-defined spaces. You can set all kinds of tools and techniques that we've developed over the years. You choose the best ones, turn the best ones into well-defined problems, validate and solve them, and then you can go back the other way and start exploring undefined and ill-defined spaces again. Here's a, the two stages that we lay out for the year, but again, you know, in a, in a corporate environment, you don't have semesters, okay? So, all right. Um, if we have the time, I hope we have the time, okay? You do have the time? Uh, I think yes. Yes. Okay. I've go got a little case study um, that I think you might find, find, find interesting. So some years back, NATO, again, we spent a lot of time working with them. And I can ask us a question. What will combat medicine look like post-Afghanistan? So this is, of course, old now because we are post-Afghanistan, okay? But at the time, they were still in Afghanistan. And all the processes that they had developed for combat medicine were designed for Afghanistan, okay? So, what, so based on, on our model... What kind of a problem is this? This would be an undefined problem because it's asking about future states, okay? So, trick question. Soldiers wounded in Afghanistan, how long does it take for NATO forces to evacuate into a, a frontline hospital? On average, two weeks. Why? That's, that's, that's the question. Why? Because in <laughs> Afghanistan, NATO had complete command of the air. That's it. So the question that they asked is, what happens if NATO has no command of the air? Which is actually one of the techniques that we use. Taking a trend and carrying it out to its conclusion. What if NATO has no command of the air? And how does this, this work? And again, all you have to do is watch, you know, what's going on in Ukraine now, okay? And the, to assume that NATO have complete command of the air would be very foolish. So, soon started. First thing they tried to do was understand the continuum of care as NATO had laid it out. Breaks out into pre-hospital hospital. They chose to work on the pre-hospital side, okay? And first thing they did was build an issue tree. I love issue trees. <laughs> <laughs> built an issue tray. And then they use another technique that we use commonly to explore undefined spaces, which is to create a scenario analysis, a classic strategy tool, but we use it, we've adapted it for innovation purposes. So you lay out a set of assumptions and then you create a two by two box. And the axes they chose were urban, non-urban, single casualty, mass casualty. And the traditional way you do it is you Label them, you put a picture up there, you describe these scenarios. And then from a strategy perspective, the question is, how do I deal with all futures? This, these are not predictions of the future. They are simply laying out alternative futures and how are we going to deal with them? From an innovation perspective, what we like to do is pick one, dive deep, explore it, for the problems that will be found in such a future. So they chose, okay? First thing they did is create an ill-defined problem out of one of the boxes, okay? What are the possibilities for field medicine in the future? Mass casualties, non-urban, and again, where that immediate evacuation by air is not possible. So they used, they went back, they used all the tools and the templates that we have, and they created a very large list. This is a partial list that they came up with, okay? We're just going to glance at it, but I, I, I want you to see its power, okay? These are all good possibilities. One, two, 
Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then some more that they researched less. And then there were some others, but they're not on this, this list. The one that they actually chose to work on was triage. So remember what we said, from your opportunities, you pick the one that, that you want, and there's lots of ways of doing it. But again, we like that upper left quadrant, but there could be lots of things in the upper left quadrant. You still gotta pick one. So they did create a well-defined problem from the opportunity, improve the triage process to reduce casualties in both military and civilian settings. Triage, everybody knows what that is? When you go to a hospital, it's whoever the, the, the emergency room works on first. You got 10 people in there, they have to make a decision. Every hospital in the world has a triage, has a triage process. Every military in the world, the combat medics have a triage process, okay? What's the problem? On a dispersed field of battle, who gets worked on first despite the process? Whoever the medic finds, whoever the medic sees, whoever the medic hears, okay? It doesn't really hold up. It doesn't often hold up, okay? So what do the students do? Built another issue tree again, okay? And then they started working out the, the, the solution. So they figured the answer was gonna come out of wearables one way or the other. They originally designed a chest one, but the military, again, design thinking, they went out to show the military and the soldier said, no way. So they ended up with a, a wrist thing, okay? So what my students did was design the MLS, the mortality likelihood score based on a set of inputs, okay? And algorithms, that's what they did. They then started to work on the electronics and the electronics got beyond them. So in the end, we paired with CTU in Prague, the Czech Technical University, and they put a team of grad students and, and the PhD students on it. The electronics here are complicated. For some reason, you can't communicate, okay? You can't use GPS, okay? There's all kinds of difficult stuff here. The CTU handled that. And together, they built it. So right now, this is the interface. You had an event, say a truck, you know, is hit, soldiers scattered, the medic can see immediately, you know, red, yellow, green, okay, every soldier in the unit, and he knows exactly where to go. This was, this was tested in the field by the Czech Special Forces, it is now in the process of actually being, being adopted in parts of NATO. Um, And then last month, actually two weeks ago, we saw this article in Defense News. Army prepares for dispersed warfare with high casualties. Future is now. And then to make it even more interesting, um, uh, last Thursday, I got a call out of the blue from a consultant working with the U.S. Army saying, I saw articles about the digital triage assistant that you're working on. The U.S. Army has one question. Does it use GPS? I said, no, it does not. And then she said, in that case, the U.S. Army wants to. Who do I talk to? So I sent them off to wherever the teams are. Gotcha. We still have time? No. No. <laughs> what? Not much. Not much? Real fast. Okay, so just real, these are, so it's just a sample of kind of, kind of tools that we use for exploring undefined, but trend, trend analysis. What you do here is you take a trend and carry it to its absurd con conclusion. For example, what happens when everybody in the world owns an automobile? What's it look like? Well, it looks like Sao Paulo, actually. <laughs> uh, um, you know, or Tel Aviv, for that matter, okay? but then turn it around. What happens if nobody owns an automobile? What are the problems and what are the, op the op op opportunities? Okay, we're gonna skip this. Scenario analysis, you just saw an example of it. Again, it's a two by two box. The advantage of a, 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 a scenario analysis is it lays out alternative futures 
including futures you like and futures you don't like. We all know what future we like, okay? But what happens if you get a future we don't like? How are we going to deal with it? Problems, opportunities. Ill-defined schools. Same thing, trends. Go back to current trends, but now look at, don't carry them to their absurd con conclusion, but ask a different question. What is this current trend destroying? Every change out there will destroy something, will wreck something. What is it wrecking? And where are the opportunities out of the wreckage? Political, economic, social, technological. Dominant designs are the fact that we all do something the same way. Every USB thing fits into a USB port. Okay, light bulbs all work the same. All over Brazil, you have the same plug. It's called a dominant design. Okay, dominant designs can be technological, but they can also be political and economic. So, another way of asking is where is a dominant design breaking down? Because out of again the wreckage comes opportunities. The most obvious one sitting here is do we really think our grandchildren are going to be? sitting in classrooms the way that we did? I don't believe it for a minute. But that design has been around since classical times. I talk, you listen. Not gonna say. It's a dominant design that is breaking apart. Okay. What are the opportunities? Process mapping. Lay it out, okay? And you have, where are the opportunities? High importance. Low satisfaction. Um, I'm going to skip this. I want to go back. One last thing I'll say. Okay? I promise. I promise. That's the last thing I'll say. <laughs> um, I actually heard a talk from the head of digital transformation for one of the big hospitals in, in Israel. And she was doing the same, same thing. She asked the question. And again, she took a trend, carried it to its absurd conclusion. And then asked, what am I going to find there? And she asked, what if you never see a doctor in person ever again? Obviously, it's not true, okay? But you can see the trend. But carry it to its end and then try to imagine an alternative future. What if you never see a doctor in person ever, ever again? What's that world going to look like? What are the opportunities? Again, the whole idea, go back to the beginning, is to force you to get out of your head, not just out of the building. To summarize, the way we do it in innovation is two intersecting models, create these banks of opportunities by exploring undefined and ill-defined spaces, pick the best ones, and the best ones we believe are in that upper left quadrant, ones that are taking advantage of higher uncertainty, while at the same time trying to minimize risk. That's some more examples, but we are, I understand, out of time, correct? Yes, yes. <laughs> what? Unfortunately, okay. but we have time to engage in the debate. So how, how do we do it? Just we go there and start the Q&A and the discussion as well? Yes, so. So, thank you very much, Professor uh, Lawrence. My it's pleasure. An awesome talk, at least for me, and I, I know yeah. for me uh, also. Uh, I would like to invite here for the discussion Professor uh, Benny Rubinstein uh, from Technion and uh, Vinicius Guzmón from uh, Medroom. <laughs> So before we go to the discussion session, I would like to uh, handle the word to Vini and uh, Professor Rubinstein to present themselves and, and tell a little bit about what you, what you do and, and how we can go on to the discussion section. Yep. So obviously, obviously, thank you again for the presentation. It was very, very rich for me. Uh, I'm Vinicius. I'm CEO and co-founder of Medro. We develop experiences for medical students, medical professionals to uh, use simulation using VR to deliver better healthcare practices. I'm Benny Rubinstein. 
First of all, I'd like to make sure humbly I'm not really a professor. To, uh, thank you for the title. Uh, I'm an MBA from Wharton. I'm a computer engineer by uh, Catholic University of Rio. I currently live in Tel Aviv. I advise some uh, artificial intelligence startups on the health space. I'm also the chairman of the Future of Health Summit. And uh, I'm also the managing director for Banco BV uh, in Israel for innovation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before we go to the discussion section, I would like to ask if anyone has any questions to Professor uh, Lawrence. Does anyone has any question here or in the audience at the internet? Great. Um, professor, I would like to ask you, what would you say are the main conditions or the preconditions? Can you hear me? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, to apply this methodology that you showed us in the industry, or in my case, we have a hub of innovation in a hospital. So what would you say would be the main conditions? Good question, and I wish I had a great answer. Okay. Um, in a classroom environment, there are none. Okay, so uh, we have done this mostly with schools of engineering, but in my classes at Hebrew University, they are not engineers. They are either physicians, um, and PhDs in bio, or other kinds of, of students. At Hopkins and at Technil, they tend to be to be engineers, but not exclusively. So I would argue that there are no preconditions from a a. a student perspective perspective the question you've asked is deeper than that which is in an in a corporate environment say a hospital um what are and if you think about it a, a a hospital is not looking for for innovation in all spaces it's looking for innovation in key in key spaces that will impact healthcare, a hospital or whatever the hospital is doing um and so i would i would think there what you're going to do is start with the key resources that the hospital already has, the key markets that the hospital already has. Sometimes, remember you have problem, solution, business case. Um, in your case, um, maybe where you end up starting is with solutions. And rather than looking for new markets, think in terms of what are the new problems, the next problems that we could actually, actually address. Let me give you one example. At universities, um, the faculty invents stuff all the time. And the process is you take your invention to the tech transfer office, and that the tech transfer office is supposed to market it. They're supposed to find the customers. I think that's the wrong question. I think the question is, what are the best problems that you can solve, given the technology and the um, the uh, characteristics of the technology or the resources that you that you that you already have. And then I go back to the same kinds of of of, of structured exploring. Perfect. Does anyone has any any more questions, or should we go? Because I have actually I I, I have well I have some questions that I would like to ask to Professor Lawrence and bring to the discussion here. So uh, I'm, I'm just not going to use the microphone because it's, uh, it's giving microphony here. So, uh, Professor, you told us uh, that we have different kinds of problems, and, and I do agree with that. We have the well-defined, ill-defined, and undefined problems. And uh, you really said that we have to go to the future and search for the problems that might happen in the future. And for that, we can use the uncertainty matrix and, and, and also scenario planning. Uh, what do you think that, that is the, the future uh, of digital health and how can we apply, for example, do you think we can apply, for example, metaverse uh, technologies and so on? And that's why I bring to the discussion with uh, Vini and, and also, and also uh, Benny to, to show about the use of digital health and artificial intelligence, the use of, of technology. So what do you guys see? Uh, as, as the future of uh, digital innovation and digital health, and how can we apply the process that uh, Professor Lawrence uh, taught us today in, uh, in a brilliant way? So again, thank you very much, Professor. I'm going to turn this one over to you. <laughs> I can I can start giving some some uh, some insights. We see here in Brazil a lot of discussion regarding this metaverse hype. 
And for me personally, I don't actually believe in much of what's being uh, talked about the metaverse, especially health. I was talking to, I was mentoring a startup two days ago, and they were trying to, to discuss solutions of attending patients using a metaverse experience. And I was thinking, what's, what's different? What's different from simply doing a telemedicine, a, tele, a teleconference, uh, a conference call via Skype or Zoom or WhatsApp or whatever, and they weren't able to answer this question. Uh, they were trying to to find some uh, some uh, justification to use technology. They didn't start looking for the problem. They started looking. They started working with the solution to work towards the problem. To, towards the problem. So uh, I think uh, using matrices or, or uh, methodologies like the one that was presented here today may be very useful for uh, professionals and students and whoever is working with technology and innovation uh, to find better solutions, not to find the better solutions, but to find better problems to solve. So I, I, I actually have a question. Maybe you two can, can, can also answer this with this one. Uh, what are the roles of the non-technician people in this, uh, in this ecosystem? Because we work with a lot of with, uh, medical professionals. We work with medical students, not exactly with engineering or design students. So, you know, how, how, this, how do they fit in this, uh, this journey? I can try. I'm sure you have a better answer, but I'll try. <clears throat> so, you know, in Israel, we don't usually answer a question. We ask you another question, harder one. This is the way we innovate. So I will ask you many other questions, but uh, trying to answer first. Um, on, on the other hand, you know, I, I have a second role here in Brazil. I'm a managing director for the global expansion of a Polo de Inovação do Interior Paulista. I can't say that in English. Um, and we are working with Embrapa, with Microsoft, with uh, several universities in the interior of Sao Paulo to bring more innovation from Israel. And we say innovation, obviously, it's not just technology, but it's the mindset, right? And uh, at the end of the day, it's uh, people innovating. Um, so a couple of things. One, uh, to be honest, when I just uh, started to have some board meetings, uh, you know, our president uh, is probably hearing us now, Daniel Pellegrini is also next Microsoft said, hey, the next board meeting next week is going to be on metaverse. And I wasn't sure like I was really uh, into it, but uh, I was invited to do a roundtable discussion like this. I told him I have no idea why we're doing metaverse. Uh, I talked to a guy who has a fund who invests in metaverse. He also I'm going to have dinner with him tonight, and he says I also don't know, but I'm investing on it. So I realized people don't really know. That's the real answer. But uh, to be more on a positive side, um, you know, I was at Microsoft Research for many years on the health space, and this is 13 years ago. I like to talk. You know, people talk about innovation like AI and clouds, and I was doing that 13 years ago, so I'm not sure uh, how innovative it is today, but it still is. The, the, the reality is two things. One, of course, metaverse includes many, many different things and technologies, and it's a concept and it's all kinds of things. One of the ingredients, which is the augmented reality or the virtual reality or all those things, um, I mean, it's a real thing, right? I worked with a guy called Alex Kipman, who's a Brazilian guy who just retired, I guess, from Microsoft. He's younger than me, and he was the head of the whole HoloLens thing at Microsoft. And uh, in the beginning, I thought this is for video games. I don't know what it was for. Um, but then we went to a conference and we saw that actually there was a doctor in somewhere in Asia, I think Singapore, was doing a surgery with, with, with the HoloLens. So bottom line is, you know, I think the technology is the technology, obviously. Um, there are real scenarios and you have to go through regulatory and lots of different privacy and all kinds of complicated things, not very innovative. Um, but in the end of the day, there are scenarios where it's, it's super useful. There are certainly several scenarios where it may not be. Um, but I wanted, if you don't mind, to uh, ask, a, and I'll talk about the AI later if you allow me, but uh, I wanted to ask uh, Professor, my, my main curiosity, I'm, I'm a big fan of the academia. I, you know, I got my, uh, my master's degree and I'm, I'm going out for a doctoral degree in uh, business innovation. Hopefully I will finish, I'm not sure. I've been in the industry for a long time. But my, my real question is, you know, I'm not, I'm not a skeptical. I mean, I, I love, I took photos and I love the frameworks. I was also in strategy consulting and I think that innovation, people confuse innovation with, you know, I'm having a beer and I had this great idea. I mean, all my friends have great ideas when they're drinking beer. The reality is how do you execute them? And um, 
And I think the one billion dollar question, I write some articles on why corporate innovation labs fail, and there's lots of literature on that, and we know many of those reasons, but my main question is, you know, I, I live in Israel, and we work with Technion and Tel Aviv University, and so many great universities, and I think maybe in Israel there's a little bit more of a transfer of the technology and know-how to the industry, maybe that in Brazil or other places. But still, like, how do we really close the gap? I mean, I, I work with, with corporations. I, I was an entrepreneur at Microsoft. I was the sixth person on the Microsoft Azure group when we took it from research and we said, let's commercialize it. You have no idea what I didn't know, like just basic, basic things like sales incentives and compensation. There's a lot of psychology. It's not just technology. Like people don't want to sell it. They won't. It doesn't go, uh, uh, it goes against their interests sometimes. And, and uh, so my question is like, how do we really start thinking about bringing out this very necessary uh, way of thinking and, and, and process and framework, which I think are super helpful to corporations and, and how do we make sure that they don't spend two years building PowerPoints and doing workshops and, and really expedite the execution, which is at the end of the day what we're trying to do. First of all, I have not worked in corporate America in over 20 years. And I have no regrets for not being there for the last 20 years. Um, so it's difficult for me to answer that, which is why I thought, you know, I was hoping to hear some things from, um, from you guys. Um, obviously, I have many, many former students who are in executive roles in all kinds of uh, great American firms, Google. And I was speaking to an executive the other day at Crunchbase, a former, former student, and I worked through, I was showing him this, because in preparation for this, for this talk, I wanted to get some more input about corporate view. So I have worked with NATO on this stuff, and we, and we actually worked with the municipality of Jerusalem on the same kind of, kind of thing. And he's actually the one who gave me that, that, that phrase, present focused. He said, the, the R&D departments, the R&D work, when they sit in a room with the, with, the, with the yellow stickies all over the place, try to think up the next big thing, it's a lot of random brainstorming and it, it tends to be very present focused. And the ability to at least use a couple of tools and techniques to get out of that and to force you to think that, the, that life is not a straight line, there are discontinuities, dominant designs do break apart, um, things do change, and things are wrecked. The ability to, to at least force people into that kind of mindset he believed would be valuable, and we will be piloting some of these things with, with his firm. Uh, and again, it's just out of, for my own curiosity, again, how applicable this is out of a classroom. Out of a, out of a, out of a classroom, if I may be so honest, I have no doubt. Okay? I think it has been very successful, and I now use it at three schools, um, and I think it works really well for students. They come up with amazing ideas most of which they then leave on the table because they'd rather take $100,000 a year jobs, you know, in the United States than, than actually go start something. The ideas are, are amazing. I think a corporate environment, I would like to believe it's applicable just to force people out of present focus. Um, but I think the, uh, as we say, the jury is still out. Right. Perfect. That's awesome. And uh, I have one question, and I think uh, the three of you can, can answer this one. I, I was wondering what is missing, for example, from the mindset and, and from the thinking of the people to go out of what I call the Cinderella model, the Cinderella model, which is you have a solution, you go for the crystal uh, problem, to a uh, mindset where you go for the problem first. So one of the things that I, I, I see most difficulty uh, both in students here and also in some of the companies that I have worked with, is the ability to look at the problem instead of the solution. What do you think is the most important change in the mindset of the people and, and the mindset of the students and the corporations to apply this, this process that uh, also Professor Lawrence uh, taught, taught us here today? So what, what do you guys think is missing on, on the companies and on the students and so on? I can give it a shot. I love that question because it sounds very trivial and it's, it's very deep, actually. I, I was, uh, I'm a mentor in a group called Product League. It's uh, created in Israel, now it's all over the world. And uh, we had a panel like this just for uh, coaching, product managers, for health. 
And um, one of the things I learned, I was at Microsoft for 13 years in a different time. And then I left, I came to Brazil to build a venture capital. And then I rejoined after the change of CEO at Microsoft, Satya. And Satya started to bring all these things about empathy and mindsets and meditation and purpose. And, you know, that was not the, the old Microsoft school. And uh, I thought it was an interesting thing. I mean, I personally am a very spiritual person. And uh, um, I thought it was an interesting change. But, but to go back to your question, I, I think that... The answer is actually very simple, um, but it's very deep. The, you know, there's a guy called Yuri Levine, maybe you guys know, was a co-founder of Waze. Uh, he was here in Sao Paulo giving a lot of lectures and stuff at the time uh, Google acquired it. And he used to wear this shirt that says, uh, fall in love with the problem, not with the solution. Now, what's really behind it is the fact that, uh, I guess, uh, when he created the Waze, he wasn't so in love with the application itself. He was in love with the problem of, you, if you've ever been to Tel Aviv, you can't drive in Tel Aviv, you can't go anywhere. You better just walk or take a cork in it or whatever. Um, and so, again, it sounds very simple, but uh, deep inside what, what it does is it makes you really think about what's your contribution to society. You know, like Professor Adam Grant from Water wrote this, um, what is it called? Give, give and take. Uh, the culture of I'm a giver, not a taker, right? Which is very well needed nowadays. And uh, again, the real problem is, uh, I think it's ego. It's a three word, uh, three, three letters word. People really think, wow, I built this amazing app. And, you know, maybe your app will be useless in like two years or maybe in two weeks, or maybe it's already useless. So don't fall in love with your great technology, your great, fall in love with this problem. Everybody's struggling with traffic. So find great ways and maybe don't hate your competitors, maybe learn from them as well. So there's quite of a mentality thing, which is, again, if you really care about climate, then, then learn what's going on, try to figure out how you contribute to that. Um, again, I, I think it's relatively simple, but it's more of an um, interpersonal skill than a, than a technological or, or a framework uh, mindset. But I think it can be learned, right? Because uh, I had this, I was his student, he was teaching me during university, some stuff that we were learning here today. And uh, I, I, I can see this because I'm from a startup and we were bought in 2020 by a big corp here in Brazil, a big educational company. Uh, and I can see these differences of how this get out of the building and this get out of, get out of your head mindset works for us comparing to how it works for the corporate, corporate people because we have different things at stake. You know, when we're trying to build a product and we go to the to the market and the market doesn't want to to buy or they they, they, they don't use it, uh, you have consequences. Uh, and I believe that corporate people have a lot of security layers that have, prevents them to have or to feel these consequences as we, as students or entrepreneurs, or, you know, as we feel, as we experience these consequences. So we, we are kind of, we're kind of, kind of forced to respond in some way and to have this uh, educational background, this this um, this toolkit of you know of methods of of tools actually to how to you know to to interact or to react to some of the of the challenges that we face. Uh, I think it helps. I I I I, I'm, I totally agree with you with the ego part, but I can see that we can also be educated on how to you know how to behave and how to 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 react to these situations uh, just, just sorry Go ahead. No, just to compliment it's not just the, the ego part it's it's also what i was trying to say is um just to give an example when i joined microsoft which so my dad's a physician and i wanted to solve all kinds of problems in health and medicine but i faint when i see blood so but that might not be a great profession for me but eventually, I, I, when I joined Microsoft, we had all these great technologies, and you know, I'm, a, I'm also a salesperson nowadays, and, and you know, salespeople would go and say, hey, this great technology will solve all your problems, because I have a sales quota. But um, when we were in Microsoft Research, I became a global product manager for this thing we're building called Microsoft Health Vault. And um, long story short, we had to work with the NHS in the UK. Now, the commercial team obviously had to make money, and they were selling lots of different uh, products. And uh, for me personally, I... I, I I basically went into some place in, in north, northern part of England and said, I'm not a doctor. And uh, we did a lot of research, used some of these methodologies and came up with the five biggest um, um, pains for, for the NHS, which were the chronic diseases like asthma and diabetes, et cetera. 
And eventually we did a pilot for uh, patients with dementia. Now, at that time, I didn't have much exposure to people with dementia, so we actually go and there's no way I can figure out how it is to have dementia or to be a relative of somebody who has. But again, we had to actually go to the field and, and, and really spend time with people and uh, um, you know, really try to understand what is the actual pain rather than assume that we got great, uh, great ways to fix that. But first, you need to understand what the real pain is. So that was what I was trying to say. I'd like to follow up with what you said. I think the key word here is toolkit. I personally am very leery of the idea of changing somebody's mindset, um, whether as a teacher, a parent, grandparent, uh, I'm a little leery of that. But I think people can be given toolkits, tools that they can choose from, uh, they can follow processes, not blindly, but simply ways of working. And if ways of working and tools and toolkits and templates help them accomplish something, then I'm much less concerned about their, their mindset than what comes out at the end uh, through the use of such tools. I think that's the key word, toolkit. To pick and choose from in order to, again, knowingly force yourself out of a present focus. Perfect. That, that's awesome. And, and this idea of toolkit, I think, represents a lot of what uh, we think that can be used as well. And one of the things that I, as I was wondering and, and considering that we have uh, different hospitals here today and maybe other hospitals uh, listening uh, at, at YouTube, uh, how do we uh, go for this idea of uh, design uh, center uh, or user center design and, and, and those kinds of, of learning and uh, development tools, but, but how can we apply that for diseases that changes over time? So for example, if we go for uh, diabetes, for example, we have a cycle of the disease. If we go to COVID, we have a different uh, cycle of the disease. So we have to think at the same time at the patient and at the disease, uh, both working together. So do you think there is a difference between the innovation process when we go for uh, the disease center view, let, let's call it this way. I don't know if you, we, we can call it this way, but do you think we have a difference on the process of innovation? And how can we deal with this new uh, thing that is happening, especially here uh, in Latin America, but in the world uh, also, but people getting, getting suspicious about technology and suspicious about the solutions. For example, vaccination. So people didn't want to get shot, a shot of a vaccine. And in Brazil, that was, uh, well, we are born here and we received a shot uh, against some diseases and now people are questioning vaccines. How can we deal with that? And how the innovation process uh, can be applied in these situations? What do you guys think is, uh, I'm sorry about this, it's a, a really deep uh, answer and feel free to answer as, as you, will, you will. So I would argue that what you have raised is a range of problems and they're not all the same. And they need to be broken apart. For example, your user-centered design, okay, is now a part of design thinking. Okay, if the problem is clear, then you're back to design thinking, you know, iteration, all those things that in good engineers learn, learn these days. But if the problem is well-defined, then it's simply a matter of working through what the solution could, could look like. Um, another kind of problem is, okay, how do I... Um, deal with a dominant design that is breaking down. In this case, it's vaccine and the acceptance of vaccines. Okay, there was at least I can remember when nobody argued about vaccines, or there were there was a tiny minority. So now you're saying the dominant design that we all want vaccines and to be vaccinated is breaking apart. That's a different kind of problem then how do I design you know, user-centered um, um, biomedical innovations? Yeah, I, it's, a, it's a question for 10 hours or for 10 minutes, but uh, I, I, I like it. I, I think the, um, I'll, I'll give a real example. Tomorrow we'll speak about some, some other methods on artificial intelligence, but uh, I think the short answer is, uh, you know, there's a, 
There's a quote from Albert Einstein that says that um, you can solve a problem with the same mindset that you created it. And I think that's the deepest thing about innovation. Like, uh, as he said, you know, in an academic world, with all the respect, a very well-defined problem and you find a solution, real life doesn't go that way, as we know, right? So when you're trying to find a solution to this problem, this problem already evolved into something else. So it's a constant catch. So I work, for example, <clears throat> with a company called Evolution, uh, which, which uh, you know, is based on uh, genetic algorithms and 10 years of, of research. It's a very scientific method. But at the end of the day, if you really take it, you know, it took me two years to understand uh, what, what it, what's behind it. And now I actually work with clients in, in Israel, also in the, um, in the military, also in the, in the medical space for the military. And the, the reality is, you know, I started to actually visit some of them, understand, for example, you know, a lot of the things they're trying to do, they are perfect for, you know, if you're in a great hospital, uh, if you're in Albert Einstein, then great, because you get all the equipment and all the conditions to do that. Now, if you are in the battlegrounds um, and you get somebody shot on the floor and you try to use the same techniques, it doesn't work. There's noise, there's helicopters, there is, uh, you can't, it doesn't work. So this is exactly the NATO example that we work with some, some elite groups in, in Israel. So what I'm trying to say with that is, you know, revolution, for, for example, they took a step uh, uh, back and said, you know, if you really look at one of the classic things today, which is data science, right? There's a whole methodology and you do the preparation and you do this, you have this 10, 10 steps. The reality is we are humans and, and we can't do, and we have a resource constraints and time and budget. So eventually you get to a solution that's not, not gonna be optimal. Or even if you are a little bit uh, more uh, of a dreamer, let's assume it is perfect solution for today. In two weeks or, in, or two months uh, or two hours, we don't know, uh, it won't be optimal anymore. And you won't go back and do this whole process over and over again. So what they do is they actually said, again, it's, just, it's a scientific thing, but it's also a, um, a sign of uh, humidity. They say, look, there is no way human beings will be able to do this. So they use artificial intelligence to build artificial intelligence systems. They say, we're going to use genetic algorithms. We're going to take all these thousand solutions that we created with our methodology. And we know even if you're a multinational corporation, eventually we need to stop. And we'll make the system continue to work and iterate and, and do permutations and combinations. And the, it will always self-select the best uh, solution based on what you tell them that your constraints are. So again, it's a, it's a mindset. I mean, we know that whatever solution we come up with, eventually it's not gonna be the greatest one ever. So there are ways in, in terms of the technology and in terms of the thinking you have to deal with it. I think with the experience we had so far with hospitals, it's not exactly maybe the, the, the methods or the templates that we use or the tools that we use regarding innovation that may change, but the uncertainty maybe and the risks, you know, when you're talking about, you surely, in real life, we for sure don't, don't we, we don't have to go all the way, uh, all the way, as deep as we went at the first time when we were trying to discover some solution. Uh, but all this knowledge that we did before uh, I, is helping us with these new uh, outcomes that are uh, being derived from the experience, from, from the reality. As, let me give you a, a, another example. I think I'm... I'm trying to think as I as I speak, and I'm I'm uh, I'm thinking faster than I, than I can speak. So I believe that when we are trying to tackle a problem, and we you know you go deep using all these methodologies, mapping the uncertainty, the scenarios, doing the analysis, etc. Uh, you you gather some level of uh, knowledge about the problem and all the. Uh, Peripherical, uh, the, all, all this peripheral knowledge on the problem as well. That when you're when when you're trying to work around some, uh, it's the problem is not always going to be disrupted. You know, uh, this is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the solution might be disrupted at for uh, uh, for a, a, a higher uh, a faster pace, but the problem not. The problem is going to change. But I don't believe it's going to change as fast or in as deep as you started to work or study it at at, at the first time. So uh, I believe we can still use the same tools, maybe not as deep as we used at the first place, but they they they're going to be still uh, useful. Perfect. And just one last question, so we can start after uh, she kills me. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna just add a, a little small questions. Is uh, Professor uh, Lawrence said, and I love that part, that the government usually focuses on high uncertainty, right? The upper right quadrant. Yeah, right. exactly. High uncertainty, high risk. Right, high, high risk. 
So, uh, and, and that is where uh, the low level TRL technologies are. But uh, should government focus on uh, solutions for dominant designs and, and, and focus, for example, in the vaccination uh, problem you said? And I, I totally agree that the dominant uh, design, and I, I, I hadn't thought, uh, think like that. And, and that is a brilliant my, uh, insight that you gave me, Professor. Thank you very much for that. Uh, do you think the government should think in the other parts of the of, of the uncertainty risk matrix, and how can we uh, teach the, the government? I, I would say teach, but it's not the correct word. But how can we teach the government to do that? And 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 what do you think is the mindset or the toolkit that we can apply to government in this in this case? Another good question for which I do not have a great answer. Um, uh, I think, so for example, NATO has a list of, uh, um, and I, I forget them off, off, offhand, of uh, there's seven technological spaces that they believe that the alliance needs to dominate if it is to remain strong into the future. AI is one, hypersonics, quantum, and there are some more. Okay? Most of these are so high risk and so uncertain you know, at least at the beginning, that it is difficult to get corporations to make serious investment. So whether it's universities or government labs making the investment, it's still government money one way or the other. But once the technology becomes clear and markets develop and you can start to imagine, okay, that, you know, the kinds of products and services, solutions that can be developed and how customers could use these things, and big companies will step in. And you're seeing it now with quantum computing. There are big companies that are now devoting resources because they can start to imagine what products and services will look like. Okay, so, but up in that, that upper right, the traditional answer is government money, one way or the other. And then corporate money, some of the things, the examples that, that, um, that were mentioned here, constant improvements that companies need to make on their products, that's corporate R&D. And that's that bottom, bottom left. And that's what most of us have spent our lives in corporate R&D doing, which again, I don't want to say is unimportant. It's extremely important, but it's not the only thing that's important. Um, we also need to be exploring that upper left quadrant as well. And that is very often the traditional space for innovators in the classic sense of the of the term and what Amar Day called promising startups and again from his work over 20 years ago. Do, do you guys have any opinion about that and should I ask one one more question here should I ask one more question uh, what do you think is the, the the way the path that the technology does in the, uh, in, the in this matrix so it starts in the upper right for example and, and goes uh, and goes to the left and then down, and then uh, what is the path you think? It's the, the way technology does. So I, I, I'll share my, my, my view or experience in a sum, summarized way. Um, I worked with the public health system in Canada and UK. Uh, there was a choice we made at the time when we wanted to launch some initiatives at Microsoft just because uh, the way it was uh, rolled out. Um, I'm a capitalist at core, and I, be, I believe that you know people say a great CEO is the one that doesn't have the answers, but he knows how to ask the right questions, bring the right people, and allow them to work. Um, and and that is what I think is the government's role. Um, I mean, there's no government that is perfect, or no country is perfect. But if you read, you know, the famous book by Sal Singer and Dan Senor, you probably read the Startup Nation Center, Startup Nation uh, book, which created the Startup Nation Center organization. Um, it talks about uh, you know, the four pillars of why Israel is such an innovative country. And the reality is the government had a really big role in that. You think about Israel, it's not a 500-year-old country. Seven years ago, people were just trying to get um, um, you know, the desert to have grass and trees. Um, and now it's a major technology innovation center. Now, if you look at historically, the uh, government created something called the Office of the Chief Scientist Program, which is now the Innovation Authority Program. Um, but again, I think, I mean, not be speaking pro properly about what the role is, but but I, I, I observe it and what they try and do is set the right policies, set the right incentives, have bilateral agreements for R&D between Israel and other countries and, and really try to unblock some of these big issues so that people will be able to come and 
innovates, and, and that's going to probably happen mainly in the private sector, in the academia, in different sectors. So I know it's a very high level answer, but I, I think they're, they, they should act as a CEO and they should make sure that the good people are going to come and they're going to have the right incentives and the freedom to, uh, to innovate, to compete, and to bring the best. So our time is over, but if you want to have a final word. Uh, I just think the government is maybe the gambler in this story, right? Because the companies are not willing to take the risks that the government do. So I think the, in this squadron, they are the gamblers. They are taking risk and uncertainty, and they are paying for that, making, making sure that people doesn't, you know, are not hurt during the process. Perfect. So I would like to thank you very much, Professor Lawrence Benny and Vini, for being here. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone from the audience here in person or online. And uh, I would like to invite you to our next section that starts in 15 minutes, right? Uh, and we are going to continue to discuss about innovation and about the culture of innovation. So thank you very much. I really enjoyed all our conversation and uh, the, the, the lecture that Professor uh, Lawrence gave us, I, I think was amazing. Really thankful, thank, thank for that. It was really great for me as well. And uh, I would like to thank everyone. And see you in 15 minutes. Thank you very much, guys. And we can have a small break to go into the bathroom and take a coffee. <laughs> Thank you.